So today's event is really exciting because we get to discuss the paper that was published by the Youth Action Team, um, analyzing the physical and digital developments and strategies and some of the emerging practices which are being used by young activists. Um, these findings really highlight some of the possible areas that we can strengthen as young people and how we can strengthen young people's role in civil society and help to really catalyze the construction of a healthy and sustainable democracy. While this is really just the first step um, in exploring you know, the activist's role in revitalizing civic space, much more research does need to be done. And we're hoping through our conversation and our dialogue today, we can explore maybe some of the gaps, some of the interesting data that you found in the report. The panel today, which is a really cool panel, um, will focus on what was the motivation in creating this report? Uh, what were some of the main findings and out outcomes? And from there, we'll have an open discussion to further understand the unique contributions that young people can add to such social transformation. But for now, we're just gonna spend the next two minutes on a jam board. And on this jam board, you're going to answer one question. What are you most excited about the conversation that we're having today? So what excites you the most about what might come about from this conversation, or maybe some interesting insight that you see on the report that you're excited to hear more about? Um, what about the conversation today excites you the most? I see here risk mitigation for the well-being of youth activists. That's a huge one. And like I said earlier, this session is being streamed live on our Facebook. And so if for whatever reason you prefer to remain private, please do just change your name um, on your Zoom settings, just for that extra security of you see. Someone else, youth integration, love that. Excited to hear more about the gaps in existing research and understanding that the team found ideas and how, and how to address the gaps. Excited to hear about the strategies used by fellow activists. Yes, that cross learning is always super interesting. All right, perfect. And whilst you complete that, we are going to move on to a really exciting section of the program because we finally get to hear from our panelists. And today we're joined by Leonardo, Chu, and Sandra, who are part of the YAC. And they will be speaking more about the um, insights from the report and really helping us digest why this report was needed and how impactful it can and should be. So I'll throw over to Leonardo first. Leonardo, over to you. Thank you, Emily. Um, so one key point that I would like to highlight, and that was a key motivation to, to create this report, is realizing that when we look at, at research being done in the field, uh, especially when it comes to young activists, youth movements, a lot of it is concerned about the particular risk that they are facing, uh, the kind of challenges that emerge when you're going to do activism and how that affects your effectiveness. But at the same time, we noticed that there was a um, missing part and and this missing part is also which are these unique attributes that young people can add to civic space and how uh, the way of doing things that young people use is different from regular social movements. So for us, a big motivation was uh, starting to discover more uh, which are some of these interesting and innovating steps that young people are taking. Um, and furthermore, one key element there is that uh, while there might be some 
individual reports about it, uh, talking about how that is happening in Asia, how that had happened in South America. Uh, there was no place putting them all together and allowing for people to, to be able to see um, how many of these trends could, could be complementary uh, and also some reports, some uh, ways in which activists are engaging uh, can complement each other uh, all around the world. So the idea was also to, to start to give that uh, initial frame and, and to be a first stepping stone because we, we feel that uh, this is just the beginning and it's going to open up so so many doors to to keep uh, discovering some some interesting features of youth activism and, and youth social movements. Perfect. Thanks so much, Leo. And you really bring out some really interesting points, particularly around just how young people are stepping into the role of being innovators in the space. And you always need a cluster of people who are willing to push the boundaries and really rethink how things are working. Um, and I think youth in particular are really, really good at that, but also they need to be enabled in order to do that and they need to be protected in order to do that, right? So that was a really good point, as well as the fact that, you know, being able to organize across, you know, different nationalities and across different cultures, um, I think is a really interesting, um, point and you know what are some of the synergies between the different countries although we are you know connected by being you um all right and then i'll throw it over to Chu to let's hear from you yeah thank you so much and um nice to meet all of you virtually um i think really for me um it's obviously a privilege to be part of the project and a key point that i think why we need such a project quite similar to what leo mentioned is that um a lot of times when we uh, we all know that youth or young people are always at the forefront, uh, we know that we are actually organizing in different countries, in different contexts. But a lot of times when we need to try to inform more people, especially for governments, to understand the efficiency, to understand the impact, to understand why we are actually doing this, um, we don't actually get a very structured or formalized report. And that's usually where people start to say that, oh, because you guys are all doing um, doing it very informally, um, you don't have that impact and focus is really just being diverted to only one or two successful campaigns. So there isn't like a proper big picture. And I think without a structured research, then people will always think that whatever we are saying, especially on the positive impacts that we have, is not actually true, but it is true, just that there isn't maybe not uh, someone to officially include it or record it on paper. So I think really the research report for, for the first part in like informing everyone about the, the trend that is actually ongoing and the kind of progress that we are having is really important to really properly inform everyone uh, about what we are doing. And obviously then the last part is throughout this whole process, we can also properly identify what are the opportunities and what are the threats as well towards um, uh, youth activism around the world, especially different countries and different contexts. And then we can properly advocate for more specified support in terms of these different uh, kind of youth activism. So it's not just a lot of times people just think when it comes to youth activism, it's just only one or two um, popular ones, uh, but really it's just so diverse. And if we can get a proper picture of that diverse organizing, then we can also understand what uh, other proper supports um, that we need to provide for more young people to be able to increase their impact. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you too. And I love the point that you made about how this report really anchors a lot of the work that we've been doing across different um, countries and, you know, protest movements and so forth um, by legitimizing, <laughs> you know, some of the insights that exist but aren't necessarily always um, reported on. Um, thanks for that. And I'll throw it over to Sandra. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Well, uh, on this important issue, why um, is the report needed? I, I think um, that this report is needed because we need to do the best kind of to break the cycle uh, from repeating. 
uh, why what cycle am I referring to? Uh, how youth are ignored, um, society approaches youth only demanding from them responsibilities or only demanding them to grow up fast and kind of adjust to the status quo. But um, they also expect youth to be the change. You know, we hear that the youth is the future, that they are the change makers of tomorrow. But uh, society is not thinking about the responsibilities they have from the youth. And they are not hearing the demands that youth is uh, bringing to, to youth. You know, society, if youth is demanding all these things and they're not being ignored or not heard or not attended in time. So this is kind of the situation and a problem um, and, and a cycle keeps repeating. And so the, the report aims to describe the situation, but not from a negative point of view, not just whining about why is the situation like this. It's from a positive point of view, you know, uh, describing what youth is doing, trying to get the trends of what youth is already accomplished. Uh, trying to, you know, like my, like uh, Leo has said, you know, kind of uh, trying to get the trends out of different places in the world and get them together and say, this is what we can say is being done by youth. So that the cycle is not uh, repeating because from some decades ago, there has been uh, different involvement of governments, of change makers, and somehow more attention has been paid to the youth but some of the problems of the, uh, are still on this area. Even if more attention is being paid, some monumental mistakes are being made on how to approach uh, youth activism. So that's uh, kind of like a, the problem we need, we, we aim, one of the problems we aim to, to, to help uh, with this um, report. It's kind of, and after we do the research and we have, more attention on the youth and we actually give more voice to what people is doing, youth people is doing and youth activism is doing around the world. Of course, this is a way or a step forward in the call of action. You know, We can now call on more open society and change maker to see the current state of youth activism and then also act on it. So I think that's also a very important part of the report because it's not only to describe the issues, but it's also a step forward in uh, fixing it. Of course, since it's a cycle, it's not going to be just one time, but it's, it's kind of like uh, hammering. And so I think with the report, we, uh, we hope to hammer a bit on the, on the issue and get uh, more of the youth activism known. Perfect, thanks, Sandra. Um, yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, particularly because a lot of the time the work of youth is kind of left out in history, primarily because the way we organize is so informal a lot of the times and removed from maybe the proximity to power. So we don't necessarily have those relationships with, you know, big powerhouses who are going to tell our stories and going to, you know, recognize maybe some of the gaps um, that exist in society and how youth can fix those. So I think it's really important that these kind of, you know, reports exist to, to again, bring that together again and really explore some of the trends that are happening. So we, we take on our own voice and we speak our own truth in our own way, which I think is really, really powerful. Um, so the word trend has been, you know, flying around. It's the sexy word of the day. Um, and so I think we can dive deeper into that. Um, and I'll throw it over to Chu, who will um, speak about some of the trends that are in the report. But I do just want to encourage you all to use the chat box to ask any questions that you might have. We will open the floor soon. Um, so it would be nice if, you know, as you're thinking, just jot down your thoughts or your questions or your comments, or whatever it is, on the chat box so that it is there and we make sure that we address it. All right, um, over to you too. Thank you so much. And, and yeah, I think first and foremost, I will really uh, invite everyone to uh, maybe later when you have time to check out the report on itself. Uh, it's interestingly designed by, by the team and by Leo as well. Um, and I think it's available online. So obviously um, for me now, what I will do is uh, to briefly share with you. So we kind of identified 
uh, five key trends uh, across youth activism, activism and movements around the world. What I will do is I will briefly share uh, kind of the contents that we uh, look about uh, in the first three trends and then later passing on to Lil uh, to share with you on the other trends as well. Um, and as mentioned, let, let us briefly let us know if you have any questions as well uh, in the chat on the gem board. So I think the first one, I think the, just as what Sandra mentioned earlier, really our idea in this uh, report is to cover as widely as possible. We wouldn't want to just focus on one or two key uh, movements, but we, we are trying our best uh, to get the diverse information around. Uh, but then obviously that is a challenge because there isn't a lot of report already ongoing around the world on youth active activism and what are the trends, especially on uh, kind of areas that maybe youth activism is just kind of growing as opposed to maybe in parts of Europe where it's a little bit like older or like the, for example, the Me Too movement, which is more, more famous in that sense. So, but, but still we are trying our best. We try our best to kind of find out what are the similarities and what are the key um, trends as well around the world. So really the first one uh, is about youth social movements. Um, and we kind of try to identify what are the common characteristics of youth social movements. Uh, and really that includes youth participation and leaderships across those different movements. And we really, I, we really realized that uh, most of their work have been influencing, focusing on the in, influencing institutions and they do have their own impact in very different ways. Uh, one of the similarities that we find out is youth, especially when they are organizing, they have the, that communal strength and diversity. So usually it's very diverse, um, um, even in within one certain campaign or even one certain group. So for example, the famous Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter campaign, it's kind of being organized by um, young people from across different age, different religious background, different kind of color as well. And then you also get, for example, movements like uh, the Fierce Group in uh, the US, led by LGBTQ youth as well. Um, so really a lot of different uh, young people, they are actually focusing. So to us, I think a lot of young people really don't care about um, how different all of us are. We just care about, do we have a similar goal? Are we trying to fight for a, a better, better society that we are trying to look for? And that's where young people are usually get it. So that's a common similarity. The second one is then youth movements are gradually going on into the digital world. So as all of you can imagine, um, not only during COVID, but pre and post COVID, digital activism uh, and a lot of the kind of uh, gathering online, that's also a key uh, trend. Um, but then that also kind of put kind of out, I think one of the key findings that we realize is that even though a lot of movements are on the digital world, then there is the issue of digital divide, safety and surveillance as well online. So really it's kind of there's pros and cons um, when everyone is gathering online. And then also the paving the way for uh, social change. So we do realize that I think a report from Oxfam, up to 57% 50, of documented initiatives uh, since 2010, and 76% of cases in kind of local and organizational policy changes were actually driven by youth. So really that showcase on a lot of the social movements, they are not just here for fun, uh, we really do have a uh, positive impact uh, towards social changes uh, around the world. Then we can go for the next slide. The second trend then we re realized on, uh, or we focused on, is on the pre-figurative politics. So it, I think it's on the next page, which then focuses on uh, young people. So when we organize, we also focus a lot on internally reflecting what values that we would like to bring about. Um, and through activism, what young people are trying to bring about is uh, their intention for a better world, for a world that has the better support for their well-being, better societal conditions, better equity, et cetera. So, so really that's a lot of the common values that young people always embed in their movements. And uh, one of uh, the sentence that's being written in the, in the report is like, in terms of that politics movement, it's really a lifestyle. It's a process and a journey for young people. Uh, for them, it's, it's that process for them to actively shape a better society. Uh, so some key points is first, they really try their best to embody the values they want in society. A lot of examples like peer-to-peer -peer learning, stronger alliances. So really when they are trying their best to advocate for inclusivity, they themselves are the ones that um, embody that value. They work together as groups. 
uh, collaborated in, in different countries, etc., in terms of those activist movements. Um, but obviously, there are a lot of challenges in between. So a lot of times, uh, youth movements are not really well supported. Uh, they lack their formal credit, especially. And really only like uh, a few major ones, like the Me Too movements, they get the full credit, they get the, the views online, etc. Uh, but some smaller skills ones, sometimes young people um, can easily feel that frustration of failure. The, the energy can be filtered down very easily because obviously not all movements are successful, not all movements are well supported by local government. So uh, really that's a challenge. That's a challenge for all people, uh, young people who are gathering on um, in their different movements to keep that energy going. Um, but really, there are also a lot of new possibilities. Like Sandra mentioned earlier, we always look at pros and cons, the opportunities and threats as well. So really, uh, currently, there are a lot of possibilities in terms of uh, groups networking amongst themselves, crowdsourcing and working together uh, as different groups collaboratively. So that's really one of the big trends um, that is ongoing as well amongst young people. The last part, uh, oh, no, the third trend, sorry, is about the variety of media actually, uh, when we, or when young people try to reach larger audiences. So uh, that's probably on the third page as well. Um, and I think the key point on that is we see traditional channels actually expanding. So um, nowadays, even governments uh, or even conferences, etc., a lot of uh, parties are trying their best to reach as many young people as possible. But then uh, the, the key point is it's not always necessarily effective. Um, obviously, then we need to evaluate uh, much more deeper on what are the effective ones and obviously what are the ones that are not quite uh, effective and just are taking the, the box uh, kind of action. But fortunately, nowadays, uh, of 198 countries, 127 of them have a national youth policy and up from uh, 99 countries in uh, January 20, 2013, obviously now they have a lot of active national youth policies and around 190 governments have a dedicated authority um, responsible for youth. But really what we are seeing is that a lot of actions currently going on, but whether they translate into meaningful uh, youth participation, that's also something we need to discuss about. Um, and then young people are also trying their best to bypass the traditional structures, uh, really that is a recurring team, recurring team, I think, throughout all different trends where young people are moving on online, having more, uh, kind of using more digital tools or social media to reach more people. Uh, I think also around um, like one of the research or report that we, that we found out up to, I think, 50% students or young people consider online activism useful and empowering. And of those 63.9%, they think that social causes really do meet their goals by combining online and on the street activism. So um, not everything online, but really that combined effort between uh, traditional practices, but also online and more creative and innovative uh, ways to, to gather. Uh, and then lastly, it's just really young people have a lot of customized engagement solutions. So really they are the innovators. They always try their best to think of better ways to reach people. So we do have, we do see young people having effective strategies like organizing radio programs uh, to reach local people who might not have more access to, uh, to online devices and they're not too, and they're not too young to run campaign. They eventually kind of grow and being adopted by the UN office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth as it's a global campaign. Um, so really that just shows that young people um, are trying their very best uh, to customize whatever they're doing and to maximize the impact they do have. Uh, but really, I think one last point I would like to mention is that um, our, our report is not comprehensive enough. Um, so it's just a short report at, at this stage. And we really, what we really need to do is we need to engage in a much more further uh, research, maybe not just on existing reports because there isn't really a lot of existing reports out there, information out there about youth trends. So what we really need now is to engage further um, to young people around the world, especially in different communities. Um, we, can, we can engage with big movements, but also grassroots movements as well. The whole process then is really to um, observe the, the kind of success and what are the threats that a lot of grassroots movements are, are facing. And then we can really understand whether um, civic spaces are really uh, restrictive towards young people and how we can push forward for uh, governments or different parties to really focus on this area uh, and make it more accessible for young people uh, around the world and different communities and how we can then maximize and improve um, their impact 
instead of just like what Sandra mentioned, lamenting on what we can't uh, achieve at the moment and, and move on to a better state. So yeah, so that's a brief summary that I have on my end. I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, thank you, Shu. Thank you for that great presentation of the first three trends. Um, now we're going to move to the fourth one. Um, and this one is about the, the lack of trust in institutions, uh, but feeling that uh, they can rely on their peers. Um, and I think this, this is important because it shows the shift from participating in traditional structures to trying to create their, their own structures. And uh, I'll dive deeper into that. Um, but first, one, one really important element to highlight is um, the World Value Survey. Uh, they were conducting uh, a research on which is the uh, voting which is the voting uh, behavior of people. And what we were able to discover is that uh, when it comes to people who are 18 to 25, 33% uh, of them have never voted, uh, this compared to 14% of people who are over 25. So the, this shows us that when, when it comes to, to younger people, the, the trust in the political system, uh, the trust in being able to uh, participate more formally, it's um, getting um, a bit lost. Uh, and this is complemented to the information that you shared before that currently, we have uh, 127 policies uh, around the area of youth that has been developed around the world from 198 countries. This is by 2016. So it's very possible that this has developed more. Um, however, while these policies are in place, these kind of spaces don't seem to be the, the spaces where young people feel that they they can contribute the most. Uh, and one area that has rose to the surface is the power of informal networks. Uh, so in, in this informal networks and more collectively owned spaces, uh, young people have found that they can uh, have a better investment of their energies that in youth councils or parliaments or other more formal uh, structures. Um, and why is that? Uh, one possible reason is that there are many unfulfilled promises that have been made to the youth. Um, one such thing is the Lisbon Declaration on Youth Policies and Programs. It was made in 2000, um, in, in 1998. Uh, and then uh, governments agreed on how to um, support policies on, on youth. Uh, and yet 20 years down the line, uh, most of these promises have not been kept. Uh, and then this created the, the feeling among young people that um, institutions are just playing with their emotions, government are just uh, creating empty promises that seem to uh, generate one vision of where to go, but uh, when it comes to reality, this is not fulfilled. Um, and, and one final point on, on, on this particular element of lack of trust in institutions. Um, is that the perspective that institutions usually have from um, young people is to have them as consumers instead of creators. So young people are beneficiaries of programs and they are just on the receiving end, but they do not have the, the possibility to actively participate, co-creating these programs or shaping how these policies might go forward. 
and having their needs heard and uh, their vision about that that kind of new world. Um, so this this lack of interest of trust in institution leads to young people moving to spaces where they can act with others as partners uh, instead of having an unbalanced power relationship. Um, then the second point um, is about the decrease on formal um, youth participation. Um, and this is connected with, uh, with several complex factors. So what we see is like young people are not engaging in the formal youth dialogue. And this is usually the tip of the iceberg, but there are other less visible causes that are generating this. Uh, one is related with capacity building. Another one is with the possibility of youth adult partnerships. Uh, another one is related with the livelihood of young people. Uh, another one with the possibilities of, of community engagement. Uh, and finally, there's another one that uh, encompasses the enabling economic, legal, and, and democratic environments. Uh, what this means is like if young people are not participating, uh, it's not necessarily because there are no spaces uh, for this formal participation to happen, um, but there are also some, some structural limitations that the system is generating and that uh, create uh, these barriers to, to be fully engaged. Mm. And one element that is also quite important here is that when it comes to the perception of what is my contribution in these formal spaces, uh, what young people realize is that the, the cost to be there is very high and is not comparable with what they are obtaining in, in return. And when they compare this with informal networks, uh, the benefits are way higher uh, and they can develop other skills like uh, their personal leadership, team collaboration, resourcefulness, decision making. Um, and in this way, uh, it's it's important uh, for them to be in spaces that are developing them to take on different roles and leadership roles. Um, and finally, one last point uh, of this trend is that, yeah, this trust in institutions has diminished. But then there's the other side of the story is how young movements are relying on peer support and solidarity. So when they find that in traditional institutions, they don't have the chance to really be able to participate in the way they want, um, they create their own structures that are more aligned with their values. and. They involve self-organization, uh, network governance, a do-it-ourselves approach, um, and in general, a space where the voice of each one counts and decision-making is made collectively instead of just one person uh, taking the lead. Uh, and this shows how young people are really incorporating as a part of their operating system uh, principles like co-creation, collaboration, uh, and building up on each other's skills. Um, so this uh, concludes the, the fourth trend uh, of lack of trust in institution, but relying on their peers. Uh, and now we're moving to the fifth one, which is around the sense of identity and belonging and how they are big reasons why young people join social movements. Here we need to highlight that young people are the bearers of the consequences that uh, politicians and our decision makers uh, are taking now. Uh, and this, of course, encompasses themes like uh, climate change, like unequal economic systems. And if do you don't act to transform them? Well, it's very likely that the status quo is going to stay the same in the long run. 
Uh, the first element here to, to have a look at is um, this sense of being part of something bigger than, than oneself. And it's connected with how we can build sustainable change. And what we discover here is that in, instead of just um, protesting around, okay, things are not going well when it comes to climate change, uh, what young people are doing as well is uh, changing their behavior and lifestyle to be more aligned with the world they would like to live in and making change in behaviors that also protect the environment where they, they live in. So things we have noticed here is that, um, for example, in the UK, 20% uh, of young people are already having a plant-based diet or would like to have one. Uh, and different studies have uh, highlighted that this could be one of the single biggest way to, to reduce environmental impact on earth. Um, so this type of, of trends show us how uh, the actions that, that young people make in their everyday, uh, that can also be part of this activism. Then uh, we move to, to another point, which is this need for, for belonging. Mm, and this need for belonging is the sense of being part of a, of a larger community and that this community is a nurturing um, community for you. And there are five main elements uh, that can lead to, to create this type of community is when you are in an environment where you can develop your competences, uh, where you can gain more confidence by, by being able to undertake in bigger projects, uh, when you get connections so you can interact with more peers and learn about their life story, uh, where you can build your character by doing some self-learning and identifying which are your guiding values and by caring, uh, which is uh, having a focus not only on yourself, but uh, on the community you're interacting with. And what has been discovered is that once these elements are part of the environment where you are, uh, there's a new element that rises to the surface and that's contribution. Once you feel that you're in a, an environment that is nurturing you, uh, you're more likely to, to contribute to your community, give back to them, and help others to access this type of opportunities. And one really interesting example there is that when you're an adolescent and you have um, multiple peers around you who are doing activism and also role models who are engaged in social change, uh, you have 96% of probability of being doing activism yourself. Um, and when you don't have these uh, kind of role models is 51%, uh, so it's al almost half. Uh, so that, that plays a big role um, when you're developing this. Um, and then we'll go to, to the final point uh, of this section of identity and belonging. And it's about telling an exciting uh, collective story. Uh, and this part has a lot to do with storytelling and with imagining how a new society is possible. And one key document that we discovered here was a book called Rebel Girls. Uh, and this book covers the, the actions of female activists in the Americas. Um, and I will I would love to, to read to you one one phrase that highlights the the kind of culture that is created there. Uh, so it goes: we talk day and night, we cook for ourselves, we laugh, we cried, we sang, we rest. And we took care of each other in a way that I doubt any of us had ever dreamed was possible. The love that we were able to construct inside those giant walls is not something you see every day. So 
here what what comes to the surface is that by enacting new worlds, by creating worlds where there are more care, where there are more solidarity, where there are collaboration with your peers uh, to be able to transform conditions of inequality, you can actually uh, start to uh, to create a vision of how that will be possible in, in a larger scale. <clears throat> so with this, uh, I conclude this, this fifth trend of identity and belonging. Uh, and then one one last point I I would like to to highlight uh, it's around which are some areas of of reflections around it. Um, one main one for me is that from the movements that we were able to discover, uh, these are usually uh, more documented movements and larger movements, and they had access to media and they had access uh, to institutions that were able to to follow uh, on the type of actions that they were developing. But most of the movements that young people are engaged in, they don't have access to big power structures. Uh, they rarely get mentioned by the media. They're really operating at a grassroots and local level. Uh, so one next step that will be vital is to, to start to uncover this type of uh, behaviors, this type of movements, this type of trends uh, happening all around the world and with more uh, informal and, and grassroots structures. Um, and I'll pass it over to, to you, Endler. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'm starting to see, you know, a lot of people nodding their heads and a lot of questions coming in on the chat box, which is great. Um, before we really delve into that, um, I just want to ask the panelists, if you can just tell us in two minutes, what does this look like practically? So from your perspective, what are some of the critical steps that organizations can take to start, you know, supporting the, the unique work of young activists? Um, Sandra, perhaps you'd like to go first. Uh, sure, yes. Um, you know, like uh, this report shows us that young activism is there. You may not see it, but it's there. Um, not because there's not enough in the formal institutions, youth is not doing and, and doing these diverse things. So my recommendation on the, on the first steps of organization is to look around you. You know, youth is not like an abstract category. It's a concrete category where you have youth doing. So look around you and recognize this uh, youth doing uh, their social media, their diverse channels, their informal organization. And if they don't come to you, you have to go to them and uh, kind of give first, give the voice, then give them trust because this is very important. You have to trust that they are uh, important and that they are doing things uh, for society. And we, you have to include them in your plans of the organization. And of course, you need to solve, kind of um, see them as partners for solving and the issues that your organizations are approaching. So I think that is like one of the, or the, the, the steps to, go forward, look around you and see the material uh, in a good way, the material of the youth material that is around you, what they're doing and take advantage of that and include them in your plans so you can uh, solve uh, and approach the issues your organization is already approaching. Perfect, thanks Sandra. Chu, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think on top of what Sandra mentioned, um, really what I recommend is also not take for uh, granted, like what kind of, um, I, th when, when we are trying our best to empower or listen to young people, also try to understand what kind of challenges that they might be facing. So for example, financially, they might be very unstable. They might not even have access to online devices. They might not be able to come. Kind of, there, there might be some practical challenges that we sometimes take for granted and we just thought that uh, so here I'm inviting you to be part of the board. I'm inviting you to do this and that's all. But I think when we say active collaboration and cooperation, it's really like working in a team where you empower them, but also understand where they are coming from, what are their challenges. And I think when 
young people or youth movements, they feel that they are being respected and they are, they are being heard, they can then also maybe work very empathetically with your organisation and then we can really move forward much more quicker with that open conversation and collaboration. So VA, I think it's just like, don't take things for granted and then try to also be empathetic in terms of what challenges that they, they might be facing and provide that support um, kind of meaningfully instead of just uh, kind of ticking the box, I think. Love that. Thank you very much, Leonardo. Yes, I, I will add only one small point to what Sandra and Chu already mentioned. And it's about how the conversations and interactions between organizations and young people are generated. And I believe that instead of you inviting young people to, to be at your table, uh, it's more like allow them to to create that space where you can come and you are like, okay, they're developing this project uh, and maybe we can contribute here uh, with this and this and this that we have. Uh, in, instead of always trying to, to make your projects fit what you're already doing. So engaging more in a, in a dialogue uh, and trying to, to have this equal partnership where we're both sides understand each other and can work more as a team than just following the, the lead of one or, or the other. Yes, 100%. So much to unpack around that alone. Um, all right, before we start with the Q&A, we're just going to take a five-minute breather, just a five-minute break, just to really digest um, all that has been discussed today. Perfect, I'm seeing some faces, which is always nice. Perfect, perfect. All right, we're gonna start off with the Q&A. Let's see, the Q&A session. Um, and sorry, if I pronounce, mispronounce your name, please just do correct me. But the first question we have is on the chat box and it's from Noir or Noor. Now, if you're there, you can just unmute yourself and perhaps unpack your question a little bit further. And yeah, we'll dive right into it. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. So, uh, my name is Nora Felisa from Singapore, uh, also part of Asia Youth Forum. So, I guess my question is with regards to the youth activism trends that we see. I understand that it comes from uh, a global kind of survey, right? Um, but would you have uh, found or done a comparison between um, what the trends are like in different regions, for instance? Because um, I guess the circumstances would be different, but also the context might be different. Specifically, I'm interested to know what uh, trends in Southeast Asia or maybe just Asia. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for that, Noor. Thanks for that input. Um, for anyone who didn't hear her, her question is in the chat box and I'll just read it out loud. Um, are there differences between the trends in different regions? Specifically, she's looking for youth activism trends in Southeast Asia. Um, so I'll throw this both to the panelists and of course to the other attendees. Um, is there anything that you noticed with regards to some of the differences between the trends depending on the region? I think I can go very briefly. Um, so for me personally, I'm from Malaysia. Um, so when I'm doing the, the research on, on part of the report, I am actively kind of also having that in mind because when we are researching, especially if it's all um, English resources. Um, so one, note, one kind of main area that I noticed at least until now is that most reports or most literature um, re research, those formal ones are mostly are focused a lot on the kind of recent trends or, or for the past few, past few decades in the US or maybe some in the Europe. But really like what uh, just now Noah had mentioned, um, there might be so many different um, ongoing 
activism or youth social movements also in different regions like Southeast Asia. And it can be quite dispersed as well. So personally, I think that is definitely a, a huge difference. Um, not only just in terms of what are they fighting for, um, but also maybe what are, what are the contexts, how civic spaces are kind of being managed in different regions as well. Um, just that I think not in the current report that we might not have that specific focus in terms of Southeast Asia or different regions. But I think this is definitely um, one of the key intentions that um, even after my, my research or throughout our discussion, we have been saying that we need to really try our best if we are trying to develop a kind of global report or we, if we are trying to compare different trends, then we definitely need to also include or try to uh, interview and get to know more about the activism trends in different regions, especially in Southeast Asia or, or kind of at least outside from uh, Europe. And I think one of the ways that we are also considering, which um, one of the previous reports that I think they, they efficiently covered a lot of different regions is um, the first ever global report on, on kind of youth protecting young people in civic space that's been commissioned by the UN Office of Secretary General on Employee and Youth. Um, and I think they really, one of their approaches is really then interviewing and getting in touch with young people from different regions. I think moving forward, we might also be trying our best. I think that's also one of the key points that we are trying our best to also uh, get in touch and reach out to more young people, not only just in Europe or um, in the US. Hello. All right. We'll move on to our next speaker. Junior, hi, do you have a comment that you'd like to make? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody. I think the, the civil space is transitioning beyond the traditional uh, process or the traditional mechanisms that were ever used by previous civil space actors maybe 10, 15 years ago, like in my country, Liberia, we had the likes of um, stomach of wolves, student organizations mobilizing themselves on university campuses to agitate against, you know, the discrimination of people from certain class of economic value getting into universities. We don't have those challenges anymore. So the challenges have shifted from what they were earlier to new challenges. So as civil space actors, our attitude and mindset to what these compositions are supposed to be changed. For example, 10, 15 years ago in South Africa, maybe 20 years back, the system needed to be radicalized because of the, the nature of the apartheid system. Now, if you talk about, you know, providing economic equality, you cannot have a radical system anymore. This thing requires, you know, advancing economic policies, advancing civil compositions, and possibly dialogue in ways to provide self-development opportunities for young people to have economic equality. So you, the, the, our, our actions is going to affect even our own spaces. If, if you've been following the news in West Africa, in Liberia, my country, last year, I led the largest anti rape protest in the country of about 20,000 plus young people in the street marching against rape in the country that has you know, 5 million people and the initial agenda reported that 964 rape cases were across the country in one year, especially in the nation's capital. So we thought to have a peaceful rally, march to the capital building where the lawmakers are, and then petition the UN, petition the, the, the president who went over to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where the president office is. So I said this to me that we, we, we have to think about advancing composition in several ways, they're being radical. And then exercising emotional restraint is extremely important also because the system is now going to be tolerant towards you. If you were, for example, to ask government for permit to protest, it's going to take time. They're going to, they're going to structure protocols and bottlenecks that will honor your two intentions or provoke you into chaos. So exercising emotional restraint for new civil actors, I mean, civil space actors, is very important. I think our emotional intelligence is one thing that we have to consider. And then somebody asked if the, the, the challenges are the same, no, they are not the same. 
culture and region's environment varies in, in the challenges we face as serious space adults. In Liberia, in my hometown for specifically, we have the issue of the, the, the gender mutilation, okay? The female gender mutilation. You're not allowed to talk about it openly because of the culture, the, the, the traditional practices of the people there. I am a civil space actor. I'm a human rights activist in Monrovia. I'm allowed to talk about that in the capital, but not in the rural part. So what we what we what we you need to do is that you have to customize your ideas into local context. So what you, what can you do here? What can you do over there? What, what you cannot do there? The, you have to understand the do's and the don'ts of the environment to be able to customize your ideas in the local context to communicate your vision to society. Thank you so much for that, Junior. Thanks for that contribution. And I suppose this links it to a question that was asked on the chat box around, what are some of the new ways that youth can find themselves participating? Um, if I can just find the questions, please give me two seconds. The question was from... was from Anil Fon, um, and he asked, what are some of the new motives and models that activists can use to engage in activism or advancing it? So perhaps someone can dive deeper into that, or Anil Fon, if you have any ideas already, please do share those with us. Some of the new models and approaches and ways that young activists can engage in activism and advancing it. The can I, can I talk? Can I speak to that? Um, um, I think perhaps we just give someone else a chance on it because we have 10 minutes okay. left of the session. So okay. we want to hear your different perspectives. Thanks, Sinia. You're welcome. Leo Sandra, anyone like to go? Or... Yeah, I, got, I, I can go if, <laughs> if, if no takes the floor. Um, yeah, I mean, one, one interesting, uh, feature that, that we mentioned there, although, uh, there's not much documentation about it is around building worldwide alliances between youth movements. So one thing that we saw is, uh, there's this emerging trend of transnational movements. Um, so like they are focused on, on one cause, let's say climate change and how from each country uh, adapted to the local realities, each one can make the push for that. Uh, so that's one clear one that, that we have seen happening, but complementary to that is more like just spaces where activists from different countries are meeting uh, and learning from one another, even if they're not involved in the same kind of topic area. And it might be that you learn that, I don't know, using artivism in your context might be a good alternative. Uh, and you didn't get that idea before from what you have seen uh, happening in, in your own community. Um, so these spaces to, to basically share um ideas what others have done uh we have noticed that that's uh one one important trend and one important opportunity to keep nurturing uh, activists looking forward perfect thanks leah for that um when i use the clapping emoji there by my profile that's essentially just saying please do just make your closing remarks um that's just my indicator so that i don't have to interrupt you um, but we have a really interesting question from Marjianta. Marjianta, you can go ahead and unmute yourself um, if you'd like to elaborate. But the question is, was there any, oh, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. Perfect, go ahead. <laughs> yes, um, um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think it was a very great um, uh, presentation and report for us to reflect on our own context because, of course, we want to avoid uh, one size fits all in any issues in development, including youth participation, meaningful youth participation. But I was just wondering because maybe I'm just, you know, when, when I saw the presentation was delivered by all male. I uh, uh, personally, and I don't see any women delivering aside from the moderator, but actively, but 
I was just wondering if there was any effort or um, consideration to include a gender lens in this issue, like, for instance, an online or offline gender-based violence, especially against women, youth activists, toxic masculinity, more social movements. I'm just checking my privilege here as a cisgender heterosexual male, because I'm, I'm. This is real. I mean, this lived experience of of that our women are facing. I think it's it's uh, you know, especially also like um, uh, uh, queer uh, women as well, but especially women. I think uh, uh, you know I I I try to to look the word women and gender in the report and it appears like you know if there is no uh, further discussion on that so I'm just wondering if there's going to be a companion report or is there going to be like an effort to to look into that because at least in my country in Indonesia it's a real issue where women activists young women activists usually face this specific challenges of gender based violence when they are being doxxed in the internet being hacked their inform personal information being leaked and then and there will be verbal harassment there will be um, attacks um, um, uh, of course specifically because they are women basically and also we're not talking enough about femicide i think female genital mutilation was also mentioned before these are kinds of life experience that only women can deliver so i was just wondering um um in the process was was there any considerations regarding this because it's a it's quite true, um, uh, and, and it, it doesn't only affect uh, this patriarchal um, views of social movements and in among youth movements that we kind of inherited also from, from previous generation, and maybe we, we want to do better uh, intersectionally, but also it affects men as well, right? I mean, toxic masculinity uh, as well. Um, uh, so I was just wondering, is there any, uh, you know, considerations to talk about this issue of women uh, of of youth uh, civic engagements um in terms of a, a gender lens um, perspective because at least in my country in indonesia i cannot speak for other regions because there's no one size fits all but at least it's it's very true this patriarchal um mass uh, toxic masculinity very dominant in our social movements and sometimes you know oh this this activist is too big to fail uh, so then you know uh, don't expose him because he's like this uh, the leader of this movement you know just uh, shut your mouth you know it's it's not worth it you will uh, invalidate our 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 fight uh, this comrade and whatever this happens a lot and then eventually women have to bear extra burdens of 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 this kind of practices so i was just wondering is there any other uh, discussions or maybe further companion reports or discussions regarding um, you know, gender-based violence and gender-based discriminations, especially against women activists, youth activists. Is this from me? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Two, I see your mic is, oh, there you go. Yeah, I just want to check Leo or Sandra, anything you'd like to add first before? Yeah, yeah. but I could uh, speak a little bit about that. Okay, well, um, I, I think it's a very important point. Uh, was to get started, I want to like I was part of the report, but I decided not to include myself in the in the in the quarters. But there were some uh, women involved in the writing, and of course, um, also the revision. So that's just to clarify. Uh, but you are right that the that um, there didn't there is a need, and I think this is actually kind of gets us to to things that we need to research more because uh, in the report, there is not uh, a specific point or a more um, uh, deep on the, on this issue. And I think, of course, this is a, a critical or a, a good point that needs to be solved or needs to be uh, deepened further. So, so yeah, so to get started, there were some women involved, but also I think what um, you say is very, very true. Uh, if you're talking about youth activism being ignored, it is even more uh, youth activism done by women. In the best of the scenarios, you are not treated really, like seriously, you know, because you're a woman, you are uh, looked upon or like it's not ser so serious work. So if you're a young woman, it's like a double uh, reason like to be taken serious in the best of the cases, you know, because in the worst of the cases, you're not only not taken seriously, but you are you know, um, oppressed, um, treated bad or abused. So I think uh, this is actually a, a very good point and something we need to to look forward in our future research. And and just a quick one to add. So I, I fully agree with uh, 
what you have mentioned in your question and also, also what Sandra have mentioned. I think also just to point out when I'm researching, especially on the first trend, um, I think it's just a different approach. So we really do identify like it's a common trend where nowadays uh, youth movements are very diverse. So including groups from LGBT, uh, QA plus communities or female activists, etc. They are now trying and they are getting a little bit more voice in terms of their activism uh, movements, but also uh, quite a we, we also built up a lot of uh, some points uh, being made by the previous report I mentioned from the uh, UN OS OSGE where, where they then also noticed that a lot of times um, there is the digital divide, there is also um, issues or challenges faced by female activists or activists from LGBTQIA plus communities or different communities essentially. So I think our current approach in the preliminary research is identifying that nowadays one of the trend is that it's very diverse. It's not just um, specific white male groups that can actually go on streets. We can definitely go on streets. Um, we can definitely organize ourselves in different countries, in different contexts, as long as you have that energy and power to, to, to get together and communicate. But then I think, uh, as, as rightly mentioned, then maybe the further research that we are kind of uh, trying to commission or build on later, then is also to identify what are uh, the, the successful, how can all these diverse groups success or understand their, their key kind of recipe that they can actually success in their movements, but also what are the threats and what are the challenges that they're actively facing, then we can really um, identify much more better recommendations or points really to improve and, and kind of build a safer place for everyone uh, to get there. Mm, perfect. Thanks so much for that question. And of course, the responses and it's good to hear that you know there are plans to have future reports and this is an initial report just to ensure that you know we speak to the diverse realities of all activists um perfect i think we will go to the very last question which is from cara wong cara would you like to elaborate on your question that you asked Sure, thank you. Um, just congratulations to all of the, the research team that were working on the report. It was a great presentation. I haven't had a chance to read it in, in depth yet, but really looking forward to it. Um, my question was really um, reflecting the fact that, as it was mentioned, this is a preliminary piece of research that was done. And you all noted that there are many different elements of the research that you'd like to explore further. And I was just wondering to, uh, if the research team came across anything that particularly surprised you or any sort of outstanding questions that you're still hanging on to that you just didn't feel like you were able to explore further or far enough in this existing report or something that you'd really like to see uh, looked into um, in future in future research. Mm. I think I can I can go there and I also connected with Marjanta's question. Um, so one element that we discover is that there isn't so much coverage of specific um, actions uh, of, of youth movement. So we found trends around climate change. We found uh, trends around, let's say, more general youth participation in, in government structures. Uh, but some topics are undercover or there isn't any any research paper uh, that is specific on youth and areas like uh, gender-based violence or uh, ways in, in which uh, women participate in these spaces. Uh, so I think de definitely uh, we need to look at uh, topics that don't uh, get so much relevance when, when it comes to what has been researched. And adding up to that, uh, like there's a big limitation when it comes to um, Global South uh, and how they appear in different reports. Like it, there's not many mentions uh, and the, the different realities of these countries uh, can provide also to, to the specific ways activism is, is done there. Mm. And then another point, it's uh, regarding the digital divide. Uh, how when uh, activists don't don't have access to uh, to the internet to to be connected with other peers, how they keep engaging, and which are some 
some ways they might be bridging the gap. So these are some some burning questions that definitely deserve to be uh, explored more and, and we believe will bring some valuable insights. And Chu, Sandra, if you want to compliment there. Yeah, I think a, a quick one to add on. Really, um, I, I do echo Leo saying that nowadays, um, research, it's always being youth like uh, youth or young people, but then this two word is just such a broad concept. It can include so many different people, and maybe there is always a lack of a specific, uh, specific research or understanding that unique differences between communities. So that's something that we, I think it's relevant maybe 50 years ago in the past where it's just a new budding concept. So you can then use an umbrella term. But nowadays, it's just so diverse and so important in so many different countries and contexts. So, so really, we need to further dismantle that idea of youth social movements and what it really means in different areas. I think also one, one, one particular key point that I, I find quite, um, um, not to say triggered, but really weird uh, during my research is that a lot of reports that we have at the moment, um, especially comprehensive ones, they are very archaic. So they are either 20 years ago or during 2013, 2010, 2007. So it's not quite relevant at the moment now because obviously throughout the past 10 years, so many things have changed with COVID, with online, with digital divide, with so many different issues as well, and with conflicts around the world. So we definitely need, I think, more active um, research and understanding in the ever-changing landscape. Um, and so really it's quite frustrating to know that um, that kind of focus is really just being based on uh, things that happened really a long time ago and it's such a, in a small kind of very minor scale as opposed to a much more diverse and inclusive uh, lens. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, we are going to officially end there, but I think there's still a lot of questions and a lot of ideas flowing through all of us. So what we're going to do is we'll just have five minutes at the very end where we will completely leave the Zoom open and you can go ahead and chat about anything you wanna chat about um, related to the topic or youth activism. It's a nice space since we're all here to network. Um, but before we go ahead and do that, in the chat box, we're going to add a link to our jam board. And we just wanna hear your thoughts around how you felt about the report in today's session. So we'll just give you two minutes Go ahead and fill in the jam board. And whilst you are doing that, we are going to have a series of events happening in August, which we'd really love to see some familiar faces in. Um, we'll put the registration link in the chat box so that you can register for the upcoming event, which will be happening on the 12th of August. So please do come. The event will also be conducted in English with simultaneous interpretation in Spanish and French that will be available. And I see the chat box is still very, very active and very, very busy. All right. I hope we're going strong with the jam board. Thank you so, so much to, of course, our panelists um, who were really responsible to give us a lot of the information that's in the report in an interesting way, which I think you did. Um, Sandra, Chu, and Leonardo. Thanks to Elisa, who's also present and helping us with sharing the link and so forth. And of course, our simultaneous interpreters. Um, much appreciated. From uh, here, we'll leave the floor open. It's up to you. Chat about whatever you feel, um, and we'll give you five minutes to do so. Thanks again from me.
Well, if if no one takes the floor, I can add something in the meantime. So this this report is also an initial exploration that will lead to a larger report where more of the the things that were missing uh during this one will be explored um and more specific uh first hand research will be carried out so in that way uh we can get relevant and updated information that we feel uh was a bit missing on this first exercise um so of course for that we would love to to keep in touch with you with your social movements with the things that you're developing on the ground to to get more insights all right i think we are good to go thanks again everyone for participating today i hope to see you during our next virtual event um yes yeah, enjoy your weekend rest take it easy and we'll see you soon bye so much thank you everyone take care thanks everyone bye bye Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining.